and let the panel chair recognize you. We'll have uh, one of our Duke Law students that will have a wireless mic that they will bring to you. Uh, that's so that everyone in the room will be able to hear your comment or question, but also we are uh, videotaping this conference, so we'll have a video transcript of it. Uh, and we need to be able to make sure that we hear your question as well as the response from the panel member. Uh, should you at, at any time during the conference have uh, any problems or anything that we can help you with or make your brief stay with us more comfortable, uh, please either mention it to, uh, to me or Eileen Wojciechowski or Donna Gannot or uh, Janice Engelberg uh, out in the front area. We, we really want you to enjoy your stay with us. Um, and as Judge, Ed, Judge Edward mentioned, uh, uh, this has been a conference that has uh, really been planned by, by two of us. Uh, and uh, Michael Myers, who has been on the new faculty uh, since 1999, uh, has become, in, in my personal view, one of my closest professional and personal colleagues on the faculty. And he and I have had the pleasure of uh, collaborating with several programs. And, and as some of you may know, Michael was leading Duke uh, at the end of this semester to go back up to Canada and take a very prestigious chair up there, and that would be our loss in Canada's game. Uh, but I want to uh, let you know that this program, uh, in large measure, is the product of Michael's planning and bringing together the very nice folks from the Canadian side, particularly, to address the issue. So, Michael, uh, let me turn the program over to you. Uh, thank you, Scott. According to my watch, I have less than two minutes, and when you work with a former Air Force colonel, you learn to keep the time. Um, so, I will be brief, but I want to, to add to what Scott said. Uh, first of all, and the obvious. I may be a, a very close and important colleague of his, but he's an even more important colleague of mine. Uh, for the last five years, we've been made much more rewarding as a result of our collaboration. In, in terms of other collaborations, I want to draw to your attention um, that this conference is co-sponsored by a number of different organizations. Um, and I want to highlight uh, for you two of those. We have two Canadian partners in this enterprise. Um, the first is uh, the Center for United States Studies at the University of Quebec at Montreal, the University of Quebec at Montreal, uh, with Charles Philippe David as the director of that center. We're very uh, grateful that people collaborate with us. Uh, the other part of the institution is the Lew Institute for Global Issues at the University of British Columbia. And the director of that institute is, of course, Lloyd Axworthy who I know is in the hotel, but given that he's on Vancouver time, he's probably still asleep. Um, but we'll see him later today. Um, in addition to those two Canadian co-sponsors, we have local co-sponsors, uh, including uh, the Terry Sanford Institute of Public Policy here at Duke, and the Pineville Institute for Security Studies. I also want to draw to your attention um, that we benefited uh, from the partnership with the American Society of International Law. Uh, this is a regional meeting of the ASIL. Um, turning now to, to substance, um, because I am a substance sort of guy, and I don't want to waste any more time. The first panel today will deal with border issues. It's a potentially huge topic, but it's a good place to start. It's often said, and I believe it is true, that the United States and Canada share the world's longest undefended border. May that remain the case. And that will, of course, only remain the case if the two countries can resolve in a cooperative way the security challenges uh, that um, they both face and which relate to that long and still undefended border. Uh, the chair of this panel Yudi Sal is a dear friend of mine who teaches at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, another very important partner institution, uh, not only for uh, Duke Law School, but also for Duke University as a whole. And I'm pleased to tell you that uh, he is also a Canadian. So, Yudi, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Enjoy.
mean that, as we all know, in terms of global politics, post September 11, in a sense, generated a need for rethinking issues such as trade, uh, free movement of people uh, between our two countries, the link between security and human rights, among other things. Um, each of our panelists will have about 15 to 18 minutes. That will give us enough time to um, answer questions. Uh, so I don't want to waste much time. I'm like my friend Michael, I want to do this with accent. And it is with great delight that I introduce our first guest, Mr. Hugh Siegel. Um, Mr. Siegel has been a major contributor to Canadian politics both in practice and in terms of discourse for many, many decades. And for those of us who had the fortune of um, attending Queen's University at some point in our lives, um, especially in policy studies, political science, or the business school, his name peppers. I was tended to pepper a lot of our conversations in my college, mm -hmm. so I'm very, very delighted. He is currently the president of the Institute for Research in Public Policy. He's also a professor of public policy at School Business at Queen's University. Mr. Siegel. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, and good morning. Delighted to be here and uh, be part of this process, and I'm delighted and very, very honored to be invited. Uh, for the Canadians in the room, all of all, all last night. Um, and the Montreal Canadians are still alive, but barely. Um, Michael Myers is coming home and we're delighted with that. He will be a national treasure. He will hold a Canada Research Chair at the University of British Columbia, which as some of you may know is a small regional institution which provides feeder stock students and professors for Queens. <laughs> So hopefully Michael will migrate up to Queens through the process over time. Last night at a reception of the speakers, Michael said that he owed um, his new job to the government of Canada because the Canada research chairs were created by the government of Canada, one of its, um, I think, outstanding decisions to uh, ensure that we kept our best academics and attract our best academics. Um, but he should also know that he's part of a deficit reduction strategy because when Mr. Martin uh, brought in the Canada Research Chairs, it was one of the various efforts in that year to take large amounts of money, keep it out of the fiscal planning process so that the surplus would look too substantial. And the billion or so set aside for the Canada Research Chairs was one of the ways of doing that. So not only will Michael enrich our academic fiber at home, but he continues the battle against the deficit in a very personal way and we deeply appreciate it. My, uh, my purpose in this presentation is not to bring new expertise on the challenges of border management. There are others here on this panel and throughout the conference who can add immeasurably more to that aspect than I can. What I want to do instead is suggest that in spite of the outstanding and hard nitty-gritty work done on border management by both governments and the private sector, reflecting extraordinary accomplishment in a relatively brief time frame, or perhaps because of all that has been, in fact, accomplished. It's time to think hard about whether we are understanding the border issue in its full dimension. I understand and accept the borders become a key measure of the battle against terrorism in both countries. Relative to what Canada's general stance should be on anti-terrorism engagement, I'm attracted by what Professor Henry Richter of York University wrote in a recent Dalhousie Center for Foreign Policy monograph entitled Independence in an Age of Empire. In an article entitled The Invisible Country, Professor Richter wrote on page 265, in our present war on terrorism, I believe that Canada should cooperate with the United States because it is the right thing to do. Canada, like the United States, is a potential target of terrorists, something that the Canadian government would prefer Canadians not think about, even if terrorists have shown no similar unwillingness. Groups like Al Qaeda despise Canada almost as much as they hate the U.S. Canada stands for everything such groups abhor: free people making free choices 
in a secular state where women have equal rights to men. It's time that Canada's political leaders understand that fact, and it's similarly time for Canada's citizens to realize that this is not a war of radical Islam against the United States. It is a war that pits democratic and secular peoples against those who do everything in their power to kill them. Canada has no choice regarding the side it is on in this conflict, and the sooner Canadians understand that fact, the more likely it is we will begin to reclaim some of the international standing we have most recently lost, and the quote that the said said better. That being said, I want to raise with you my concern about how we view and understand the border challenge. The Maginot Line of Fortification built on the Swiss border to the Belgium, and named unhappily for this poor soul for Henri Maginot, who was France's Minister of War from 29 to 32, was built to be impregnable, was never finished, and was not complete by the outbreak of new hostilities in 1939. It was designed to respond to the technologies and battle plans of the 1914 war. It was utterly useless in the face of the Nazi history of 39. Seven billion francs were invested in the line. It had three interdependent fortified belts with anti-tank emplacements and pillboxes. Bravo and Van Rostaff went through the heavily wooded and semi-mountainous areas of the Ardennes and invaded the line completely. There has been increased funding of at least 30 billion US dollars to the Department of Homeland Security since 2001. A host of new programs have been constructively put into place by Canada and the United States aimed at tracking and apprehending the guilty or those with personal patterns that reflect greater terrorist risk while expediting the trans-border movement to the assumed innocent, the honorable, and where possible the pre-cleared, pre-filed, pre-inspected, and certified. Canada has created a new border, Canada Border Services Agency on December 12, 2003 as part of the new portfolio of public safety and emergency preparedness. The new agency will be responsible for 75 different laws, including customs, intelligence, and enforcement, for citizenship and immigration, and important inspection and points of entry from Canada's food uh, inspection agency. In the immediate post-911 federal budget in Canada, then Finance Minister Martin approved many billion new dollars for various aspects of security. There are roughly 200 million travelers who cross the Canada-US border every year. All of the above invites us to ask some serious questions about border infrastructure and what revealed protections are against the random mass murder of our residents by terrorists. And to assess the extent to which the border focus may be an unwitting focus on the most convenient as opposed to the most salient points of real vulnerability. Let me connect for a moment a core defense theory and a compelling aspect of human nature. It is always better, according to conventional defense theory, to fight the enemy as far away from home as humanly possible. A partial victory or even defeat abroad is always better than a successful engagement at home, because the latter will cost innocent civilians' lives at home, always an option to be avoided. Threats to any institution are always externalized, if you think about it. Canada blames many of its internal problems unjustifiably on the United States. University presidents blame governments for internal financial pressures. Investors always blame regulators. Public health officials blame faraway sources of virulent infections. Unions blame greedy employers. Shareholders blame management. Families blame schools. Unhappy wives blame mistresses. It's part of our culture that danger and risk come from elsewhere and can or should be kept away and dealt with elsewhere. Both these conceptual and psychological realities can be seen over our collective history. Calling a deployed military force an expeditionary force reflects the popularity of sending troops, quote, over there to confront, contain, or eradicate a risk. Over there being the very real opposite of over here. Songs like Over There, or It's a Long Way to Tipperary, or We're Going to Hang Out the Washing on the Zip Creek Line, all speak to the deep need people have to know that there are barriers of space, time, and friendly troops and forces between the problem, the threat, 
and where we actually live our lives. As democracies require trust to work, and as trust is tied to confidence, democratically elected politicians on both sides of the border have a real and understandable interest, not to tax from the public, to be seen to be investing in efforts abroad and at the border to keep the risk and threat contained. This is not to mention the interest that congressional members from border districts have in more jobs and investment in their district. What possible other option for democratic leaders and public servants have? Well, it's at conferences like this, think tanks, research centers, and universities, where we can ask some fundamental questions about the underlying assumptions. Let me refer to these thematic questions for this morning's purposes as the imaginal line of the fire. Why? Why do we believe that terrorists will choose our most horrified, heavily prepared and data linked infrastructures at the border as their desired means of entry? What is it about terrorists and their practices to date that would lead us to that conclusion? Two, we know from various published documents that to the extent there are explicit terrorist plans and targets, harming Americans, Jews, Israelis, and citizens of those countries engaged in the war on terrorism in Iraq or Afghanistan in the greatest possible numbers in places of maximum exposure and least protection is very much a desired outcome. If one talks to people who live in countries regularly faced with terrorist mass murder of civilian and essentially innocent populations, this terrorist tactic is however repugnant and barbaric, quite predictable, making people fearful of every school bus every open air cafe, every discotheque, every restaurant, every university campus, downtown square, leads quickly away to confidence, trust, cooperation, and common cause. Fear is the terrorist's short-term goal. Panic is the higher dimension of that fear. Despair is the medium-term result most helpful to the nihilist worldview the terrorist to take. The idea of a border between a good country and the bad between innocent civilians and enemy combatants is, by all assessments, utterly irrelevant to the terrorist. Three, the asymmetric nature of the terrorist threat is about the opposite of land, sea, and air border. It is about, first and foremost, destroying the border between civility and mayhem, between sane private lives and civil societies, and random death, mutilation, pain, and carnage, the more random and horrific the better. People jumping from burning towers, body parts strewn hither and yon, children killed on the way to school, these are all victories for the terrorist planning framework. Terrorists rarely have prison records discernible of border crossing. They usually commit one barbaric and heinous mass murdering crime. Asymmetry means precisely that, the denial of any balanced or logical proportions, the absence of balance or harmony. Orders are about the organized application of rules, procedures, principles, judgment, and human intuition to find and address risks that have attributes associated with risk in the past. Four, the real front line, the real border that truly matters in terms of freedom and civility, is the border in our day-to-day -day life between predictability of a life without fear or intimidation and death mass murder, and systemic panic. The front line is not an isolated border crossing near La Colle, Quebec, or between Montana and Alberta. The real front line is where we live, where we work, where we recreate in our cities and communities. That front line is not of our choosing. Those who blew up innocent commuters in Madrid, those who killed thousands in New York and Washington, those who blew up school buses and pizzerias in Israel, clubs in the valley, and the rest. It is they who chose that front line. Doing all we can to move the front line back to our borders, airports, seaports, sea lanes, and terrorist recruitment and coalescence spots around the world is worthwhile and vital. But why would we rationally conclude, and on the basis of what evidence, that it is sufficient? It is both unavoidable and natural that a civilized society would want to have some sort of checkpoint power between itself and the terrorist threat. It is unclear that evidence supports the viability of this concept, however company it may be. Clearly and for good reason, airport security in North America has been increased. 
In Canada, evidence of stricter standards, better and more thorough scanning equipment, more uniform training are evident. The core question which existed well before Madrid is whether enhanced airport security obviates security at office towers, department stores, shopping malls, railway stations, theaters, large crowds, and in general. With airports better protecting the terrorist target preferences clearly stated, are we really at war with terrorists? If other large crowd venues are unprotected or only sporadically protected, are we invested in one border infrastructure while avoiding the border between civil society and terrorism may well matter as much, if not more? Six. In the end, security and freedom is about far more than territorial borders. Even though territorial borders may be among the most compelling government concerns on this issue. We know that disease, environmental risk, criminal networks, drugs, illegal arms, financial fraud, and money laundering are essentially undeterred by borders. Why would we rationally conclude that terrorism is deterred by borders? In Canada, the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service is long before, and certainly well before the tragedy of 911, the existence of terrorist-related groups connected to conflict around the world, including the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as well as those in Egypt, Syria, Sudan, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Northern Ireland, the Punjab, Sri Lanka, Turkey, and the former Yugoslavia. There is little reason to believe that the presence of similar groups is in any way less meaningful in the United States or Western Europe. As the old adage that if all you have is a hammer, and that every problem is a nail, determine at least in part the nature of government response to the terrorist threat. Is the pre existence of warfare infrastructure the most compelling reason for the continued intensity of focus on that infrastructure? Is the investment in the border, which I heartily encourage and support, a strategic and tactical response to the real nature of the threat, or a response that is least, least likely to inconvenience domestic populations where they work, live, and congregate? An old economics professor of mine, now a senior official at the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ottawa, spoke at an IRPP conference in Montebello in 2001, October of 2001, uh, which was entitled a conference, the conference was entitled Governing in a World Without Borders. While the conference was planned before the 911 tragedy, we did spend an evening with a mix of politicians, academics, scholars, students, business people reflecting on what that event may have meant long term. The DFA official phrased his concern this way, quote, when just in time becomes just in case at the U.S. Canada border, Canada has a huge problem. So while genuine security and protective screening is the primary purpose of investment in border infrastructure, um, doing what is necessary in security terms to keep open the economic thoroughfares and proceed through the border is of compelling interest. While showing Americans that Canadians are doing their part so as to forestall the ultimate sanction of a closed or further constrained border is vital, one should not assume that it is coincident with the application of investment in those places in society where citizens are most vulnerable. Security is about security. The Classville Marine or the BCE complex in Toronto had come down on 911. Canadians would believe that security is about security. In the category of cameras making all problems of today, we have to look at the cost of new organization and new structure. Our governments have spent a tremendous amount of time and effort to reorganize, restructure, new departments, new limits. While it may be helpful in apprehending terrorists, reorganization and restructuring do not necessarily have a relationship to apprehending terrorists. If it does, it is empirically untrue. Without building up sincere and good faith efforts to this point, we have to ask ourselves, are the costs of professional reorganization better spent elsewhere? Are malls and public venues were better protected? Would that be a better use of those funds than, um, than if we kept reorganizing various government departments on a professional basis? Let's make it perfectly clear that it's not our armed forces, it's not our police, it's not our borders that are the targets of terrorist activity. It is our civilian populations where they work, live, and recreate. And that is the border we have to address. A word of conclusion. The massive investment 
of money, time, and technology by government, civil servants, law enforcement agencies, and the private sector at our borders is driven by a mix of security and economic considerations. It is laudable and reflective of the best of cooperation between two allies. The belief that national border infrastructure can protect against real vulnerability in local high-density locations is unfounded. Most security agencies would agree that it is only one part of the answer. Security is about keeping people safe from violence and random terrorist acts. It is not about economic flows. It is important to keep in mind that we have to be brutally and publicly honest about the less than common relationship between departmental organization, border infrastructure, and real public security. The national border deserves support and modernization that cannot take place at the expense of the real border between civility and panic, the border that protects the average citizen in their day-to-day -day lives. The security arrangements between our two countries are about more than borders. Cooperation between agencies in our two countries is at an all-time high. The linkage between first responders and local preventive capacity has never mattered more. The borders that matter are not the 49 pattern. The borders that matter are in our day to day life. And if we focus on the 49th parallel at the expense of the borders that matter, we leave our population unprotected against the real enemy and their precise and stated charge. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Daniel Bridge. Uh, he's a political economist. Teaches at York University. He's also the director of Robert Center for Canadian Studies. He has written a provocative book uh, dealing with the issues that our panel is addressing today. It's called Borders Matter. It's out there. Um, for those who are
and they did not see a positive outcome from the U.S. occupation of Iraq. The growing divergence between Canada and the U.S. with respect to security, political refugees, cross-border movement of goods, and NAFTA is significant, and the gap between the two neighbors will continue to grow. The peaceful kingdom of the Canada-U.S. border that has not moved a centimeter since it was established in 1846 by the Oregon Treaty now has become politicized. And the critical role of the border as an institution for domestic political purposes polarized to an unprecedented degree. These are the two great changes that we're looking at today. The politicization of the border on both sides of the border and the polarization between the two countries on what should be, how the border should be uh, mattered in all the critical areas, particularly immigration, refugees, uh, security. Canada cannot escape its place in North America. Instead, it has to learn to shape it and act on its strategic self-interest. Canadians want to retain a sense of proportion and not undermine the jury system, fair proceedings, and respect for human rights. Uh, so far, we have no policy model, social theory, or policy yardstick to grasp the dramatic changes to North America's borders as in a security mode, commercial aid, regulatory fence, and an identity line in the sand for citizenship purposes. Every border has these four aspects the moat, the gate, the fence, and the identity line in the sand for citizenship purposes. Ottawa has yet to learn how to get all the ducks to line up. By contrast, Washington has a powerful framework and policy instrument driven by U.S. homeland security legislation with its multiple goals and institutional coordination uh, across the face of uh, a government. And Homeland Security is the defining uh, uh, legislation, as most of you know. And this massive reorganization of U.S. government to conform to the uh, Patriot Act and Homeland Security is worrisome for Canadians who have yet to define their national interests post 9-11. Americans have no hesitation. They have been expanding their security state since 1947, when on July 26, Congress passed the National Security Act, that quietly and without much debate at the time, uh, set in motion uh, uh, the legislative mach machinery to create independent intelligence agencies to defend U.S. national interests against uh, uh, foreign powers, uh, foreign, uh, foreign threats. Now, America's moral mission puts uh, Canadians directly in the line of fire of the new U.S. security doctrine, which calls for preemptive action against rogue states and their terrorist clients, and assumes incorrectly that all allies are loyalists, not skeptics. The result is that once the once undefended border has been transformed into a heavily policed and militarized frontier, Uh, in the previous century. 
with a proactive program of electronic surveillance and policing mandated by U.S. law. So in a security-focused world, the politics of the Canadian-U.S. border require smart, independent thinking and nerves of steel for us. The important questions to ask are, how are Ottawa Canadians planning to address these dramatically changed circumstances? Are Canadians, when I say here, are we, as Canadians, in charge of our side of the border in the long run? Can we do this? What policies and models of the border are best suited to our needs? So let's contrast and think in terms of the difference between a commerce first border and a security first border. A commerce first border prioritizes two way access to each other's markets, it values cooperation through negotiations, and much of the government function is conducted through informal contacts and ad hoc, ad hoc arrangements between U.S. departments and Canadian ministries. Canadians spend roughly $125 billion a year on passports. That is the cost of generating of, 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 of creating passports. The border for Canadians economically is hugely important. The border generates $30 billion in GSP revenues and other uh, uh, fees for the Canadian government. In proportion, if you put this 30 billion uh, in comparison to uh, the 26 billion in tax revenues it collects from the corporate sector, right? 26 billion from the corporate sector, 30 billion in GSP and other revenues from the border, we can see that uh, the border economically has not disappeared, its functionality has not disappeared, and it is a very significant uh, source of, of revenue generation. It is a superficial, superficial one. Of course, the border is people friendly. There are over 200 million crossings a year. But the basic rule of thumb at this border and every border is that every car, every person that arrives, every shipment of goods has to check in and check out. We have no other way also to decide citizens. And so the border is a primary leading institution that differentiates Canadians from Americans, Mexicans from uh, 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 Canadians, Mexicans from Americans. Post September 11, there is no longer consensus that each side is equally responsible for its side of the fence. The U.S. command model uh, is in the U.S. command model. The border is directly managed by Homeland Security Act, which is a complex array of policies and forces where the rules and practices that manage the border are tied directly to U.S. domestic politics. There is only minimal input from Canada or Mexico. The new command model of the border is to be a seamless institution integrated vertically and horizontally through the executive arm of the U.S. government down to its local level. Its design architecture of the U.S. border today is to be everywhere in every state. This alarms Canadians. Uh, many U.S. border policies are extraterritorial in their application and are not tied to U.S. territory. The new Homeland Security legislation has a clear objective to transform border practices into a Kevlar-like bulletproof vest. Goods pass with little hassle. People face many obstacles and barriers that are ad hoc and arbitrary, and the implementation, implementation of the new rules are like the individual U.S. immigration official. It is not like NAFTA that was negotiated. This is not the NAFTA model any longer. NAFTA is a kind of the way in the back. Instead, Homeland Security is a bare knuckle, unilateral policy framework that sets down the rules for others. Now, I'm just going to five minutes. Well, I want just to mention very briefly because the next panelist is going to speak at some length on human uh, rights. But, um, 
the, the Arar case, which you're going to hear about, he was a, a, a Canadian citizen born in Syria. He was arrested in 2003 in New York while traveling home to Ottawa. Despite his Canadian citizenship, U.S. authorities deported him to Syria, a declared enemy of the U.S., where he was tortured and eventually released without ever being formally charged. U.S. Uh, uh, the U.S. is supposedly most of the U.S. and allies was not consulted. His input was not requested, and the U.S. security machine ignored U.S. obligations under the Vienna you know, Convention. Now, what is important here is that, for you to uh, recall, that under Article 6 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, every citizen, whether born here or not, has the right to enter and leave and remain in Canada. At the border, there should be no difference between native-born Canadians and those who have chosen Canada as their new home. Ottawa is on the firing line to protect land immigrants from this kind of discriminatory and arbitrary treatment. But so far, there has been no strategy or policy in place to protect land immigrants and citizens who have assumed that they're naturalized citizens from U.S. authorities and U.S. laws. Ottawa has largely cooperated with the Bush administration in the areas of immigration and security, typecasting the immigrant as a potential or real threat. Now, uh, in record case, for instance, Canada's national government passed the Bill C-11, which was the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. It expands the government's detention powers over immigrants who are being security risks and reduce the mechanism for independent review of ministerial security decisions. The point is, the Canadian government uh, has been very active uh, in, in changing the Canadian laws and legislation. And I think it is a fair comment and important to remember that public opinion indicates that Canadians are critical, unsupportive, nervous, and uncertain of the effectiveness uh, of, of these uh, policies. Now, as the implications of U.S. security needs are being worked out in many areas by the Bush administration, these need to be closely monitored by Ottawa. So far, and this will surprise many of you, there is no top-level Canadian governmental structure mandated to produce a major audit of all the U.S. statutes that bear directly or indirectly on Canada. There has been no public legal assessment of the impact of Homeland Security on Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, and uh, there has been no audit to clarify the potential or actual violations this U.S. law poses with respect to the rights of Canadian immigrants and political refugees. Nor has there been any fundamental examination of the impact of U.S. security needs with respect to national provisions and U.S. trade law generally. Canada's parliament has not debated the extra uh, the legal dimension of homeland security and its uh, effects on cross-border manner. So I want to set some up and uh, leave you with the following. Post 9 11, the politics of the border require a great deal of smart, independent thinking and action of applied sovereignty and the setting of national priorities. The U.S. government is at odds with uh, its principal allies and with many Americans. It is unable to see the world through the eyes of weaker powers and is blinded by the strength of its own mythology and the dominance of its uh, uh, culture. American firstism has naturally produced a very different assessment of threats and the proper means to deal with them. One. So, I think it is significant uh, in the bylaws that Canada's business elites have dissipated to reverse course and trade outside the traditional commerce and enterprise box. They have failed to recognize that domestically, there is broad support, paradoxically, in Canada for George Washington's wise counsel that there can be no greater error than to expect or calculate upon favor 
Foundation to which we thank
border in the limited sense of a border post, like the one I grew up uh, near the uh, main, that, that I grew up beside in, uh, along the main Brunswick border. Uh, but rather, I guess, as, as a line uh, that runs through many aspects of the Canada and U.S. relationship. The two dimensions I would like to look at are counterterrorism and refugee protection. And when it comes to human rights, the border has taken a hit on those two fronts post September 11th. Let me begin with the counterterrorism context, which of course could be vast, and I'm very conscious of the fact that there is a panel devoted to that very topic. I'm only going to consider one particular angle here, and that's the issue of sharing of intelligence across the board. Uh, as Daniel has just alluded to, this is an issue that has been a very sensitive one in Canada-U.S. relations over the past six months in particular because of the case of Nagar Iran. A case which I am confident is well known to all Canadians in the audience because it has received an unprecedented and unparalleled level of media, public, and political attention, and will be the subject now of a federally established public inquiry, which will commence substantive hearings in mid-June. Others may be less familiar with the case, so just let me sketch the bare bones of that. Major Arar is a Canadian citizen of Syrian origin, now 33 years old. He immigrated to Canada with his family when he was 17, and has been a Canadian citizen for about 12 or 13 years. In September of 2002, he was on his way back to Canada from a family vacation, visiting his wife's family in Tunisia. His group took him through to AFK Airport, where he was arrested and accused of being involved in terrorism. He was questioned repeatedly without legal counsel, despite his frequent requests to have access to a lawyer. His description of the questioning indicates that the primary interest in him appeared to be people he did or did not know in Canada. He did not receive a consular visit until over a week after his arrest. And almost two weeks after arrest, he was awakened at 3 a.m. one morning and soon found himself on a small plane, the only passenger other than the crew, being security personnel. He was flown to Jordan, then taken overland to Syria, where he remained in detention without charge of trial, without access to legal counsel, for almost one year. He was released and returned to Canada in early October last year, and had publicly provided a riveting and disturbing description of how he was treated at all stages of what he calls his nightmare. It includes an account of agonizing physical and mental torture in Syria and detention in a tiny underground cell that had no natural or artificial light, a cell he just turned his grave. All of that, and no authority anywhere, has ever criminally charged Mr. Arar with any offense. Since his return, he has been persistent in demanding answers as to why this happened. In that regard, he has launched a lawsuit in the United States and following relentless public pressure, now also looks forward to the public inquiry in Canada. Well, there are many troubling unanswered questions about Major Arar's case, questions that implicate at least four governments, Syria, Jordan, the United States, and Canada. Much of it does revolve, though, around the Canada-U.S. security relationship, and particularly the question of what kind of information is shared in the context of that relationship, and importantly, from an international perspective, what safeguards, if any, are in place to guard against information leading to human rights violations. It does seem clear that Canadian law enforcement and or security agencies did provide information of some description to U.S. officials about Mr. Arar. We do not know if it is as tenuous as Mr. Arar knows Mr. X, Mr. X knows Mr. Y, Mr. Y, lived in the following country and we are suspicious of him. Mr. Arar has described that to be his fear, that this happened to him simply because of who he knows. We do not know if there is anything more solid. There certainly has not yet been any public indication of what that could possibly be. And whatever it was, evidently it was not enough substance to lead to criminal charges to be brought against him in either Canada or the United States. It does appear though to have been enough for a number fundamental human rights to be disregarded. In Canada, many questions have been asked about this case. 
What information was passed on to the United States? What contact was there between U.S. and Canadian law enforcement officials during this detention? To what extent were Canadian officials aware of and might even have consented to the U.S. decision to render Mr. Arar to Syria? Did they object? What did they do once he was in Syria? The sharing of intelligence and information obviously plays a critical role in ensuring security, fighting crime, and even in protecting human rights. Shared intelligence can play an important role in identifying and forestalling human rights abuses before they take place. Shared intelligence can play a role in apprehending individuals who have committed serious human rights abuses and ensuring they face justice. But shared intelligence, be it reliable or wholly lacking in credibility, can also lead to serious human rights violations, particularly when that information is further shared with security agencies in countries such as Syria. What Mr. Arar's case tells us is that Canada and the United States need to put in place a human rights protocol that will govern their intelligence sharing relationship. It is, in fact, something that should be pursued more widely than just the Canada-U.S. relationship, because since Mr. Arar came home, there are several other cases now that have come to light involving that same mix of detention abroad, torture, and intelligence sharing in which the United States, at least on the surface, does not play a role. I expect that the public inquiry into the Arar case will provide important recommendations in this area, but even at this stage, it seems safe to suggest that such a protocol should address some of the following points. Given that it is difficult to know where information will end up and who will make use of it once it is shared, that extra care should be taken to ensure reliability before allowing information to cross the border. Information that is shared should be clearly identified according to the degree to which it is considered trustworthy and has been corroborated. Mechanisms should be put in place to monitor the subsequent use of shared information and a binding means established for one country to object to any intended further use of the information that is likely to lead to human rights violations. Specific and obligatory assurances should be provided by both governments that shared information will not serve as the basis for or be used in any way that causes human rights violations, including arbitrary detention, torture, or expulsion to torture. Reaffirm a clear commitment between the countries to allow immediate and unhindered consular access in keeping with the Vienna Convention when a national of the other country is taken into detention. A commitment to honor each other's passports. An explicit understanding that extra legal renditions will cease and that the procedures used and decisions taken to deport or exclude anyone from either country will be in full accord with applicable national and international legal standards. That is, I'm sure, just the beginning, but that is precisely what is needed. A beginning to ensuring that what is done in the name of security at the border is done also in the name of human rights. Let me now move to the second issue I wanted to highlight as to where human rights issues face a challenge as security ramps up at the Canada-U.S. border. Refugee protection. Refugees have had a very difficult time in this era of heightened security. Worldwide, and certainly in both Canada and the United States, fingers frequently point at refugees as being the source of insecurity in our midst. Refugee systems are porous, we are told, Canada's in particular. Right for abuse, easy victims for would-be terror planning their next attack. As such, there are demands for restrictions, exclusions, more detention, more deportations. In the rush to blame refugees, what is frequently overlooked is that while there is inevitably a real potential for abuse in any system that is, after all, about human beings and human lives, the vast majority of refugees themselves are fleeing insecurity and fleeing violence and need and deserve protection. 
One very concrete outcome of this security-related focus on refugees has been the decision taken by Canada and the United States to negotiate what is often called a safe third country agreement, now finalized and expected to be operational by the end of this year. Under that agreement, the bulk of refugee claimants who pass through one country on their way to the other will be bumped back to the first country and told to make their claims there. In practice, this means that a large percentage of the approximately 10,000 refugee claimants who pass through the United States each year on their way to Canada will no longer be able to access Canada's refugee system and will instead be required to make their claims for asylum in the United States. A couple of side notes and reminders are instructive here. First, the simple, unchangeable reality of the refugee journey is that for many, there is no other way to Canada than through the United States. Certainly for Latin Americans traveling overland, that goes without saying, and even for refugees from other parts of the world traveling by air, there are very few direct routes into Canada that do not involve a change of claim in the United States or in Europe. And second, while this agreement is certainly described as a two-way street, a responsibility sharing agreement, the overwhelming impact will be on refugees traveling north to Canada. Very, very few refugees come through Canada on their way to making claims in the United States. For that reason, it is something that Canadian officials have long been interested in, a very crude way to reduce dramatically the numbers of refugees making claims in Canada every year. It's interesting to note that about eight years ago, uh, when the two governments once before came close to concluding such a deal, with considerable enthusiasm from the Canadian side of the border, it was scuttled uh, near to the last minute, the rumor being that the White House had learned of it, and it being 1996, an election year, which called it off. But this time around, post-September 11th, the political landscape is very different. This time, the safe third country deal is being framed as part of the larger Smart Border Initiative, meant to be part of a package which will tighten up security around the North American perimeter while supposedly keeping things moving at the 49th parallel. Moving for others, perhaps, but not for refugees. But what is the concern here? After all, isn't the real objective to make sure that refugees are safe? Does it really matter whether that place of safety be Canada or the United States, even if the individual, him or herself, may have particular reasons for preferring one over the other? And that is precisely what the fundamental test should be, safety, which should be judged by one clear and essential standard, the international human rights obligations that are at stake. And at the border, at the moment decisions are being made and refugees are told that they cannot cross, that they cannot make a refugee claim in Canada, human rights are very much in play. And two fundamentally important human rights issues are being overlooked by both governments. The first is the US practice of immigration detention, and the second is the approach taken to gender-based refugee claims in the United States. To stop a refugee at the border and turn him or her back is to put that individual at risk of arbitrary detention in conditions which do not meet international standards, and if the refugee is a woman fleeing abuses such as domestic violence or so-called honor crimes, it is to put her at real risk of being denied the protection that is her right. The Safe Third Country Deal will have a particular alarming impact on refugee women. Many women flee their home countries because of gender-specific forms of human rights abuse, such as domestic violence, honor killings, and sexual slavery. International law recognizes that when a woman faces that type of abuse and her government fails to intervene and provide her with protection from that violence, it's not simply a criminal law concern, a private affair, or a social problem. It is a human rights violation. And that woman must be able to look to other countries through refugee protection to provide her with the safety she has been denied at home. But US law on this point has for many years now been in a state of flux that is frightening and distressing for the women whose safety is at stake. In the mid-1990s, the Guatemalan woman, Rodi Alvarado, who suffered horrific abuse at the hands of her military husband, fled to the United States. She was granted asylum, then lost it on appeal. Three years ago, former Attorney General Reno set the decision aside 
issued some provisional regulations recognizing gender-based refugee claims and ordered that the case be reconsidered. But the regulations were never finalized, and Ms. Alvarado still awaits her final decision. This is not just about arcane procedures or appeals and regulations. It is about real lives and real safety. And until it is clarified, refugee women fleeing violent spouses or vengeful community elders, and who cannot, as should be their right, turn to their own government for protection, cannot count on the United States to safeguard their rights and rights. At the border, where decisions are made as to which side of the frontier a refugee woman should be able to launch her appeal for safety, those basic rights hang in the balance. The Canadian-U.S. border stands for many things. For friendship, for commerce, for trust. I suggest to you that it must also stand resolutely as a place where human rights are paramount, where human rights will not be sold short. I have touched on two instances where that has been put to the test recently, intelligence sharing and refugee protection. As the security imperative looms over the Canadian-U.S. border, the fundamental human rights at stake at times seem to be forced to retreat into the shadows. But to pursue security at the border or anywhere at the expense of fundamental rights and freedoms is ultimately only to foster greater insecurity. For human rights and security are fundamentally intertwined. Without security, human rights will always remain fragile, and security that is not firmly grounded in a true respect for basic human rights will never be anything but tenuous. Thank you very much, Alan. Our next speaker is Ms. Linda Dewar, who will touch on issues pertaining to where our two governments work together in terms of policy since September 11, as far as issues of security and standing border issues, and the way forward between our two countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's not apparent, I think, from my title on that, that I am, in addition, I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Canada and Mexico, basically. I manage the Office of Canadian Affairs and the Office of Mexican Affairs and the Office of Mexican Affairs in Europe. So I do see the border issues take up a fair amount of my time, and the challenges are probably very different on the two borders. It's something that I do spend some time on in the United States. I want to talk today a little bit, in very practical terms, about some of the things that we have actually done together with the Canadian government on the border. What are the concrete steps that we've taken? What are we looking forward to in the future? And how is this relationship working out? I think it's important to start by saying that, certainly, for both countries, they have no higher priority than the safety and security of their citizens. That's a given. That's what we start with. But we're also acutely aware that the $400 billion annual trade across that border is a lifeline for both of our economies, and that we have to work hard to maintain that lifeline and not to damage it. Clearly, after 9-11, we face challenges on how to guarantee safety and not slow this vital trade and damage the relationship between the two countries. So our goal has been to protect the country, but also ease this trade and the travel that is essential to both our economies as well as our national character and the partnership that we have with our friends in the European Union. So we started with this in December 2001, with a 30-point action plan on the secure and safe smart border. Since that time, as we said, we've worked to make the longest undefended border both safe and efficient. Some of the concrete things that have happened since then within that plan is we have done things like develop common standards for passenger screening so that we're both looking for the same thing at the same time, and we're constantly working to improve that. And we welcome suggestions from this panel and from other people. We've also 
government in this knowledgeable class about other security measures on this and other um, issues that we need to take. Uh, we have analyzed how both countries issue visas. We have discussed our list of countries that are eligible for visa-free travel. Canada still has more countries that are not, do not require a visa than the United States does. Uh, we are in constant discussion about that. We have created binational steering committees to oversee our shared efforts on critical infrastructure protection and biosecurity issues. Many of you may be advisors to some of those um, committees. We are now finalizing agreements with Canada to share information on customs lookouts and other potential threats that we might face. We're negotiating the sharing of information on visa issuances and refusals. We have, in fact, doubled the number of customs and border protection inspectors on the U.S.-Canada border, but that not, is not necessarily to keep people out. If you have more inspectors, you can also move things faster. Uh, we've indeed tripled the number of border patrol agents patrolling our shared border. However, that is still only 5% of the border patrol personnel and represents fewer than one agent for every three miles of the border. We've created the Nexus program, which may be some of you no doubt have heard of and maybe even members of. Uh, these are for trusted travelers of U.S. Canadian citizens or permanent residents. It costs $50 for a five-year validity card, and it, it's just a way that you use a dedicated lane to move back to you be a trusted traveler to people that we know. One of, the, one of the goals at the border is to separate the known travelers, the known goods, part of it we're not concerned about so that we can focus more attention uh, on people that we don't know and groups that we don't know, which is trying to make it more efficient. Uh, we are now operating 11 of these high volume, of these lanes, these special nexus lanes, at high volume process. 60,000 people have enrolled in the program and we hope to expand it. Uh, we're developing a nexus, a similar program for air travelers. We're going to pilot this at Ottawa's airport, and this will allow frequent air travel also to use dedicated lanes to speed their way through immigration customs. Uh, this will enhance our pre-clearance program, which has been in place for many years, well before 9-11, by which 85% of air travelers from Canada cleared U.S. immigration and customs before boarding the flight. We've created the free and safe, free and secure trade program, the FAST program, which speeds the movement of cross-border truck traffic. It uses uh, a public and private partnership. We work with the private sector and the company to create a secure supply chain the lowest goods from known suppliers. Shipments from approved companies, transported by approved carrier, using registered drivers, be cleared into either country with greater speed and certainty and reduced cost of compliance. This frees customs officials to focus on lesser known, higher risk traffic. FAST is currently operating at 12 high volume commercial crossings with 15,000 drivers enrolled. There will be 23 more commercial lanes with fast capable, that are fast capable by the end of 2004. So very quickly, we will, we will almost double the number of fast lanes. Canada was the first country to join the Container Security Initiative and has been a crucial partner in our Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism Program. These two programs allow us to effectively target our resources Screening incoming cargo before shipment leaves its international port. This is part of, again, pushing borders out to these things that we can. As part of this effort, we have exchanged customs officers at our major ports to screen containers. Canadian and U.S. inspectors are working side by side at the ports of Newark, Seattle, Halifax, Vancouver, and Montreal to screen incoming cargo. We have enhanced joint border enforcement through integrated border enforcement teams, the IBEX. IBEX are coordinated local, state, and provincial law enforcement authorities to counter cross-border crime and potential terrorist activity. These teams meet regularly to share operational and information. We now have 14 of these units working across the full length of the U.S.-Canada border. We've also received excellent cooperation from Canadian law enforcement and intelligence agencies um, sharing information. A Canadian representative for 
participate in the U.S. foreign terrorist tracking task force, which is one of the items in the third point plan. This, this works, this task force works to prevent foreign terrorists from entering North America. Canada and the U.S. work together in the cross border crime forum, which annually brings together federal, state, and provincial law enforcement personnel to improve cross border cooperation on a wide range of criminal and terrorist issues. We will also work together to involve other countries in our efforts to move the border out. We plan to build on the efforts in the, of the G8, who are discussing some of these similar kinds of initiatives, the International Aviation Organization, ICAO, and other, in other fora, one of the goals is to create a common standard for screening of prison people that will be worldwide. The longer-term goal is a system of shared responsibility and shared information to facilitate legitimate trade and travel. We have made tremendous progress, as you can see from all the different initiatives that have been started since 9-11, the tremendous cooperation that we have received from the Canadians, the very, very good working relationships that have been started in any number of fields, that we've made a lot of progress, but there's still a lot to do. Um, we have to recognize that the border cannot be ignored as a potential entry point for terrorists, and this is a huge challenge. Um, we welcome Prime Minister Martin's decision to create a new Department of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. We, we have already started working, our Department of Homeland Security has already started working closely with them. Um, we also welcome the decision to provide all border funds within the new Canadian Border Services Agency. Both these changes will significantly improve the safety of Canada and of all North America, we think. We also support the Canadian government's proposed C7 anti-terrorism bill, which is in the parliament at the moment. I have myself have attended the last two meetings, the final meeting between Tom Ridge and John Manley, and the first meeting between Tom Ridge and the Deputy Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister McClellan. Uh, and those meetings have really been characterized by an enormous cooperative spirit and give and take about priorities between the two countries, um, frank, honest exchanges about what, what can be done and what cannot be done within the legal mechanisms that are, that are different in each country. Um, and those, that relationship is continuing across, as I say, within the Canadian government. Um, obviously, both countries want to, we need to be sure that we're protecting our border but where we are committed to doing so in a way that is true to our history and to our common values. And we're going to continue to work together to build this new system of cooperation across the border. We'll achieve this goal in the framework of each country's legal and political system. We are not trying to change Canada into the United States, but to figure out cooperative ways that we can work together, acknowledging these systems to make both countries safer. I think it contributes to our shared values and our long friendship that we have accomplished so much over the past few years, and we will continue to make significant progress in the years to come, I'm sure. And as I said at the beginning, we do, um, we're constantly adding to the list of things that should be done, ideas that people have for making the countries safer and more secure while uh, continuing the open relationship that we've had for so many years. So it's good to have, uh, I'm glad that there are conferences like this. We're glad to have um, other people looking at this and making suggestions to us, um, and as well actually as, as having um, groups, NGOs, and groups of like managers to um, walk in what we're doing and making suggestions, making comments. I think that's part of the entire process as well. And so I think it's, it's important that we listen to those, to those views and that we hear what people have to say. We will continue working on our best. Thank you. Thank you. Our goal, as far as this panel is concerned, was to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, the issues that each of us um, presented are uh, very contested and uh, challenging. So we wanted to leave it, you know, lots of time for questions. So um, the forum is open. We can address your questions to any of the panelists. And someone has an eye.
So I, again, my name is Wesley Work. I won't take up too much time because I get to take up your time next. Um, but I had a question uh, for Linda Jewell. Um, and it concerns watch lists. Um, there's been a recent report by the Auditor General in Canada, Chapter 3 of which um, called attention to some uh, significant uh, gaps in um, the evolving Canadian national security practice. And one of the gaps she called attention to is watch lists. Now, I appreciate you may not want to um, comment on Canadian practice, so we always recognize that we welcome criticisms, but I wonder if you could um, fill us in on um, American, the current sort of status of, of American practices with watch lists, um, the reforms that you've been making on the American side, and, and how the United States side of this plugs into the Canadian side, because of course you've had your problems with watch lists too. Yeah, actually, that was going to be my first. The first, uh, I, I, would, I do hesitate to, get, to comment on Canadian practice, most especially people in glass houses should not throw stones, because because indeed that was one of the first and continuing uh, issues that we have is and with how to how to create watch lists, how to coordinate everybody's individual watch lists. I mean, that was one of the things that you immediately see when you really start focusing on. Um, security and counterterrorism, that there are lots of different organizations within the U.S. government that do this, and they weren't as well coordinated, and I think from the 9-11 hearings that have been going on for the past few weeks, it's perfectly obvious to everybody that lots more needs to be done in that regard. So I think um, coordinating watch lists, getting everybody's watch lists put together, um, certainly on our side, is a, a primary goal, and Obviously, from our point of view, a similar goal would, uh, would be important on the Canadian side. And as you said in, the, in my quick remarks, we are talking, at least on, on, it, on some levels, about sharing information back and forth about watch lists. So, you know, work in progress, but I don't have anything um, more specific about it to say than that. My name is Don McNamara from uh, Queen's University uh, in Kingston, Ontario, and, and we <coughs> sit right on the U.S. border uh, and at the edge of Lake Ontario at the beginning of the St. Lawrence River. And one of the concerns that I have about our discussions about border, the longest undefended border, 3,000, 4,000 miles, however one defines it, um, is we, we spend an awful lot of time talking about the discrete border crossing points. I think that there is something in the neighborhood of 150 such points. And as, uh, as uh, Joel pointed out, uh, you have new Border Patrol facilities, one officer for every three miles. But notwithstanding that, about a third of that border is in fact water crossing. And from where I sit in my living room in Kingston, Ontario, I can see the United States. And on a summer's day, I can see a thousand boats. And I know that within the past three months, there was a boat of some 20 illegal Chinese migrants that happened to have the good, the, the good fortune, misfortune, to land at the dock where there was a customs officer in, in, uh, uh, in northern New York State. But otherwise, if they had gone 100 yards in either direction, they would have landed without any detection. Now, as Mr. Neep points out, it, the third party, or the uh, third country, safe country, uh, provisions uh, may cause some more pressure not to go through the established border crossing points, but to go across at the, at the path of least resistance. And we think that the uh, um, terrorists that we face have at least some modicum of intelligence to also seek the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is not limited to the water crossing points, but we have thousands of miles of trackless waste and another problem area, which we call the Aboriginal uh, borderlands. So my question, without getting involved in any kind of uh, classified information, is how are the border agencies looking at this major problem, in my view, of not the discrete border crossing points and the passage of trade, but the, the uh, absolutely infinite number of border crossing points uh, that are extremely challenging in terms of patrolling and uh, control it. Uh, well, you certainly outlined the magnitude of the challenge uh, that we face. And I think, again, it, it speaks a little something that, that 
you have to start with, with where the most people cross and where we have, in fact, had terrorists cross in the past. Mr. Resson trying to come into the United States for the Millennium, at the moment time of the Millennium Plan. Um, and then moving out. And it, it is extraordinary. You're right. It's a huge undefended border. What do we do about that? We were all, um, we in, in the State Department, um, it came out a couple of weeks ago, and we were glad actually that it did. That the, the agency that's in charge of keeping the border clean, I mean, just keeping it literally mowed down so we can find out where the border is, is underfunded. And so we're actually losing where the border is. But I mean, what it means is that's ridiculous, I know. Um, but so, so that, I mean, that's the kind of thing, obviously, every that kind of pays attention, we all went, oh my, you know, this is, could this make us look worse? Um, so we are going to have to attend to being able to, and, and when you have a clear path, you can do more. Again, we're doing more on electronic um, surveillance, and that, you know, you don't have human being if you've got uh, um, sensors and that sort of stuff. Nevertheless, gear set off sensors, and, you know, this is not, this is, again, work in progress. We are, you outlined the challenge very well. There are people looking at it um, in, in more sophisticated ways than I have to outline. But it, that I, I'm not going to describe in detail, but it is a huge challenge, and we have not come up with the answer yet. My name is Gordon Gibson. Uh, I, for a brief period of time, worked for the State Department. Uh, that this is just a simple-minded question that will that provokes all sorts of uh, political consternation. But to, to Linda's um, recent remarks, uh, you know, regularly I get a lot of young people that, that ask me, why the devil do we focus on that imaginary line, or maybe not so imaginary since we're mowing it, um, but the, the, we, we talk so much on both sides of the border about common values, common principles, all this economic exchange and so forth. And, you know, it just seems to me that the answer, and I know this, I can say this word in the United States, I can't say it in Canada, it, it, it is the perimeter and, and the dignity of that mode line is is um, much less important if we are uh, enforcing mutual standards, not U.S. standards, but mutual standards uh, at the perimeter of our continent. Uh, and, and if, in fact, we are such close friends, if our attitudes are so similar with respect to principles, um, that ought to be something that, that can be accomplished, and the debate has to be joined. I mean, free trade took a election debate in Canada and, and took a lot of consternation in the United States, the extent to which we have free trade. So you know, we, we need to get over it and move on. Uh, so uh, with, with that said, I, I'd like to at least ask the representatives on the panel from Canada to uh, uh, reflect on that perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first, uh, first I'd like to uh, comment on Canadian presentations. I think what you saw was a very good balance of respect and uh, views in Canada around the border. Canadians have never thought very long or very hard about the border they share with the United States. It is trivialized uh, in, in, uh, around metaphors long as I'm defended, meaning that it's, that, that it's you know, it's not a serious thing, it's not much that it is, it was a secondary institution. But I, I, I think that we, 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 we think now about the border in a, in a very different sense. It's not simply uh, this kind of joining some dots together, but borders are created by, uh, by geography and by, by law. And it changed by circumstance and mentality. And the border is the institution, the lead institution of the state. It's created to represent uh, the 
the uh, social and economic and cultural values that reflects all that. So it's a much more uh, uh, it's much more complex institution than simply being uh, uh, a gate for Congress. And I think that there are, uh, uh, despite it, our interdependence and our links back and forth at many levels, micro levels, community levels, family levels, civic levels, uh, and communication flows, I think there are quite different views uh, of the border and its place, particularly with respect to security and citizenship. And I think that, uh, that this is a very important issue that has to be addressed, that it is not business as usual from the Canadian side or from the American side. And there has to be, I think, uh, an attempt for uh, quite a different consensus and about particularly that disease. I think Canadians now understand the border as the key to their multicultural, diverse society, and that the issue of political refugees and immigrants becomes a very big issue within Canada. And it's, it's not one that stands down to security. But, and I think Alex is quite right in saying that the place of the border has been given new importance by the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So, I think we're going to have a lot of difficulties uh, on this because gathering information at the border is not, uh, we have very different uh, views about uh, the extent to which we should be gathering this information. Who should have access to it? I mean, do Canadians, are they supportive of uh, the idea that there's going to be this data base and every, everyone who goes to the United States will will be part of the system. There are a lot of problems. Canadians have a lot of uh, uncertainty. So I think that while we can speak of that there has been a lot of cooperation, I think that there is quite a, a shift, what I call, from the commons first border to the command model of security first border. And I think that Canadians are very uncertain of how they want to cooperate without, unless they have a, a lot of guarantees and assurances Canadian institutions and values will not be undermined. Just really briefly, I think uh, Ambassador Griffin underlines uh, a prickliness on both sides of the border about the border as an instrument of sovereignty, which I think Canadians and Americans had better get over and get over fast. If the Europeans who bombed each other to oblivion for decades, centuries could get over it in some important respects. I can't see any reason why Americans and Canadians should not be able to get over it. Many of the human rights and refugee protection provisions suggested by my co-panelist Alex Neve as being fundamental came about because governments, including the government of Canada and the government of the United States, prepared to merge their sovereignties in important international understandings which made the world a better place. That's what progress, I think, is about in the era in which we now live. So the notion of taking some of the outstanding joint efforts referenced for the 49th era and extending them to a more uh, contiguous perimeter operation should not be problem, provided we don't make the same mistake at the perimeter, which I think we are making at the 49th parallel which is to concentrate our efforts on a line which may be much more imaginal line and much more imaginary. I don't think that there's any substantive evidence to suggest that diffused, asymmetrical terrorist cells think about the border in their planet. They think about a major business center in the United States. They think about a hockey arena in Canada where a lot of Boston and Montreal fans are in the same place. That's what they think about. That's where we have to engage, and we should be prepared to do it jointly. Historians of the Cold War will know that we had joint border teams at Canadian airports dealing with aircraft from the uh, communist world on an ongoing basis with joint cooperation, with mutual agreement, and with looking for the same kinds of folks who constituted potentially some sort of risk at that time in our history. And certainly, 
If we're going to make progress on the human rights of refugee issues, which are important to the salience and civility of both our societies, we have to be prepared to do it together. And I think the perimeter is as much of an opportunity for that as the 49th parallel. In fact, it may be more realistic. One thing we do have to keep in mind, one of the differences in Europe, and people have this notion of change, agreement allows everybody to move around anywhere they want. It's actually only about economic migration related to jobs, student activity, and, and, and special permits that exist. But in Europe, there is an understanding, and Mike and I have had this happen to us on the streets of Madrid within the last couple of years, that you can be stopped by a police officer for no apparent reason, none of what we would call in our country's probable cause, and ask to see your papers, if you're delighted to provide we're more comfortable, but delighted to provide. That is not the norm in our two countries, nor should it become the norm in our two countries. But we do have to look at that perimeter, not only in the continental context, which makes the obvious, logical, literal sense, but also in the context of what the real targets of opportunity for the forces of darkness are, and who it is we're really trying to protect. Civility, in the end, is about doing that, and doing it jointly wherever possible. Hi, Doug Murray, I'm from the Air Force Academy. Ultimately, a nation's national security policy is a response to a, a threat, real or perceived. And if that security policy is a shared policy between nations, it would seem to me it's based upon a shared perspective of the threat. Uh, as I sat here and this is some very fine presentations and very insightful and very helpful to me as I try to grapple with these issues, it seemed to me that there was implied in what was said that there is a distinction or difference of some kind between the American perspective on the threat and the Canadian perspective, both with respect to the public opinion view and the formal position of the government. Is there such a perspective? Is there such a difference uh, posed by this new uh, post-9-11 uh, threat? And if so, uh, what is it? Well, I tried to give you a, a, a I think a, a, a flavor of uh, what I call the uh, sharp difference in public opinion on uh, key security issues. And I think it is quite, uh, uh, first of all, I think it's important to note that uh, if, if the uh, Kurdistan's refusal to send Canadian forces, it might have been seen as a ad hoc, uh, 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 ad hoc it was uh, in a context where Britain, where uh, France and Germany, Mexico, Chile, there were a large number of countries which refused to support the initiative. Uh, if I would have had more time, I would have spoken of the Canadian focus on multilateralism, international law, and international cooperation as the, the, the fundamental principles, I think, that uh, are, uh, are that form the Canadian policy. I think there's quite a sharp difference today between the Bush Doctrine uh, and its commitment to multilateral uh, institutions, international cooperation in international law. Many of you maybe have not read, but it would be worth looking at this new, new book called America Unbound by the Brookings Institute. It's, a, a, it's quite, a, a, I think, a, a, a persuasive argument. There has been a, a fundamental shift in the United States. I think Prestowitz's uh, uh, book uh, and, and others on rogue nation raise uh, similar kinds of questions. Well, you have to uh, realize that uh, the NAFTA debate of a decade ago does not uh, is is no longer the the defining uh, 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 framework of Canadian foreign policy. And what we find is that in many areas of Canadian life, in terms of government spending values, uh, 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 practices of all kinds, Canadians are more skeptical and less committed to uh, falling American leadership at, at the world level and at the continental level than at any other time in, in the past 40 years. And I think that this reflects uh, honest differences of opinion about the wisdom of American policy, and, 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 and most precisely, in the area of security policy. So uh, I, I think it's important for you to be aware of that. 
And the question will be whether uh, uh, American policy uh, uh, will uh, expect uh, loyalty as the basis of policy, or whether it, it, whether it accepts uh, that there will be sharp differences in many areas between uh, uh, United States and its allies. Canadians want, uh, will expect the same, uh, to make the same kind of policy decisions for themselves as Americans make for themselves. And I think this has brought us to a new relationship. I don't think that, and I think this is a healthy. Uh, it's healthy because I think we have to uh, work through these issues and differences. And the question will be, uh, to the extent of the openness and the willingness of the Bush administration to uh, engage with its allies and with Canada among them uh, on these policies. Can I speak to that? Um, I just want to say that the question was actually asked in terms of the nature of the threat. And I do not, when in the government discussions between the two countries that I am privy to, uh, or that I hear about, I see really no divergence between the description of the nature of the threat. Where we diverge uh, from time to time are on the tactics to address that threat um, because of the different, again, the different, the different